For today's talk, we have the pleasure and honor to have Professor Elena Gaura from Coventry University. Elena is a professor of pervasive computing and has worked on the inception of sensor-based systems to resolve applications where intelligent processing of data at source is critical. She is a board of directors member at the UK's Women's Engineering Society and serves on the external advisory board at the Census Centre for Doctoral Training, Cambridge University. She is very active in promoting capacity building for women. She also serves in the humanitarian engineering energy sector, developing ways to engage women with renewable technologies in the global south as pathways to empowerment and employment. I, I couldn't say more than that, uh, Elena, but uh, your, your, uh, your bio is impressive uh, with uh, so many things, but I chose to highlight, uh, you know, the parts where you're so active in promoting, uh, you know, the role of women in engineering and in science, in STEM in general, uh, and also, uh, you know, the role that you're playing in on the African continent, uh, you know, to promote engineering. We're in the midst of a, of a revolution in the supply, storage, and use of energy because of climate change issues and net zero carbon emissions, amongst others. The war between Russia and Ukraine is reminding, uh, is reminding us all how important and urgent it is to review our strategies in the energy sector and business as usual is not the solution. Rob Sanders from the UKRI recently said, traditional centralized energy systems have been inefficient and unadaptable, but new possibilities point to a future of flexible, clean energy systems designed around consumers. Great opportunity lies in smart, integrated local energy systems, which have the potential to bring cleaner, cheaper, more efficient energy to our communities and to build local jobs and prosperity, and quotes. Basically, what I read uh, is that energy systems should be more decarbonized, decentralized, democratized, and digitized. So this needs a shift in the thinking, and it is precisely this kind of shift that we at Medin are trying to bring through our lecture series. Professor Gora will take us through this concept of smart local energy systems and the role it plays in designing energy provision, delivery, and consumption. Her focus will be on Sub-Saharan Africa. Elena, the floor is yours for about 45 minutes and we'll take up questions thereafter. Thank you all for attending online. Uh, and for those who are online, please use the chat box for, uh, uh, to post your questions. So Elena, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much again. Thank you, thank you. I, I hope everybody can uh, can hear me. I don't know um, whether you are able to uh, see me as well or, see or not. Yes, we're seeing you and uh, uh, we're seeing you and we're hearing you very well, perfect. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for the very, very warm um, um, welcome and also thank you for um, colleagues um, uh, at uh, UniCity that have um, reached out to me and taken an interest in both uh, my research and, and also the possibilities of working together and collaboration in the future. Um, it goes without saying, I would have much preferred to be in the lecture theater with you rather than uh, at the end of a virtual terminal many thousands of miles away. And I still hope that uh, um, th th that maybe in the future we can um, we can be together in the same locality, exchanging ideas, brainstorming, and better understanding how we can come together to do great things in energy, in the digital space, and generally around the generation and use of data for the improvement of society. So for the talk today, um, I, I I thought I, um, I I do a slight commentary on benefits and challenges of digitalization through the Internet of Things advances, and to put a, a bit of a sectorial angle to 
um, to the talk, I focus on energy. Um, it goes without saying energy is something that preoccupies us greatly, um, greatly today, not only uh, because of the, 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 the new and quite terrible um, war that, uh, that has been going on for, uh, for such a long while now, but also because the climate crisis is strictly put um, right, 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 right on us and, and um, uh, it is our duty to, um, as citizens and as researchers, as engineers, as society, uh, as a whole, to try to save ourselves. So energy together with the Internet of Things, um, leading on to data and the nature of the data that we gather from energy systems, the usage of that data, and how we can use all of the elements of an energy system to, to empower ourselves uh, for the world of the future will be things that we'll be talking about um, in the seminar today. Next slide. <laughs> Uh, I called my first um, technical slide, so to speak, in the talk, uh, a speaker's ambition. I, I really would like very much to, um, to try my hardest to bring about an understanding of the role of smart local energy systems in designing our future energy provision, as well as the delivery and consumption of energy. And the references I make are from the global uh, perspective, but also some examples are brought to bear from the sub-Sahara context, which is the con context I had um, the honor and the pleasure to work within in the past five years, in particular in, um, in Rwanda. So I would very much like to try to identify some of the challenges and benefits of transitioning to, to digitalized systems, maybe some of the insights into the key structures and design principles, um, maybe also bringing an awareness about the cultural appropriateness, um, the, the ethics of the energy systems design. And that's, these are things that engineers by and large think less about, and I would like to bring them to the fore a little bit more uh, and, and bring a focus and a lens on the role of communities in shaping the future of energy. For so many years, we are used to think about energy systems design and energy overall, the commissioning of energy systems and the provision of energy as being the realm and duty and the remit of the engineers, of, of those who, who really know how to put things together, make them work and, and get um, a fossil fuel into a, a consumable uh, energy service in our homes. And, and I would like to, um, to contend here that, that actually technologies are playing only a small part in what our smart local energy systems should be in the future. And engineers only play a small part of um, the groups of people that have to come together to design and implement and deliver fair, ethical, uh, functional and sustainable uh, energy systems for the generation we are living in and for the future generations that inherit the earth. I'm going to be um, uh, quite happily seconding uh, um, our, our um, uh, honored host in their um, take on what energy systems, what the energy systems in the future should, should look like from the UKRI perspective. And I put here a quote that I wish us to keep in mind. Um, that comes from the director of our newest um, energy um, revolution program in the UK that I have had the pleasure to lead cyber physical systems, the cyber physical systems arm on. So the UK has decided to, um, to invest uh, quite, a, quite a large amount of money in the past four years. It was uh, uh, something around just over a hundred million pounds in order to evidence the utility and the importance of getting smart and getting local in our energy systems provision, meaning we are going away from the approach that says we have to revolutionize our uh, national grid, our national uh, network of uh, energy provision, and we need to, to uh, impress upon the um, um, analog nature of, of energy, but revert that and say, actually, we can draw more value out of locality, 
out of designing local energy systems with local communities, and we draw more value out of smartness in those energy systems as opposed to uh, more robustness in the analog counterpart. So uh, with this, I'm going to move on to the next slide to give you some reasons, only some of the many reasons that make the digital transition in energy so urgent. And I've pointed there to a number of, um, of aspects, each of them that I could have portrayed um, differently or many more uh, with many more um, evidential uh, um, attributes. The first and foremost um, uh, pointer to my urgency in digitalization, going digital in energy, is the global energy crisis. A global energy crisis requires rapid development. And rapid development cannot lay anywhere else than other, other than with renewables that can offer the energy efficiency and the low emissions uh, that, that we are seeking for the planet. So rapid development also speaks of digital because we know how to make things happen fast in the realm of the software, in the realm of the digital, in the realm of a computerized world and computerized control systems. So because we are in a rush, because we need to be in a rush in order to solve um, or partially contribute to solutions to um, the global energy crisis, we need to make those solutions digital. The second um, aspect that, um, that, that speak at urgency is, is that um, of, of architecture. So anybody and any of you that, um, that, that have any training or any mind to systems engineering, anybody that's used to complexity or has thought about the complexity of an engineered system, and we have loads and loads of examples of engineered systems around, um, uh, uh, around our, our, our normal lives, a building is an engineered system, a city is an engineered system, will appreciate that just adding things on top of existing infrastructure can actually lead to overcrowding, under efficiencies and the burden the architecture that is more likely to fail. So transitioning from um, ad hoc additions on analog architectures, analog infrastructure is not likely to serve us well in the future. So with architectures becoming more complex, shifting now onto the digital that allows any amount of transformation to happen uh, more or less at the press of a button, it's an advantage, uh, I would say, not only for energy, but for all other um, aspects of life, for planning, for city planning, for transportation planning, for um, logistics, for, for, for um, um, the, the, the complexities of um, uh, food and farming transitions and so on and so forth. So architecturally, we are better off building from here on and transitioning to digital rather than maintaining the old status quo. The third point I, um, I brought to bear is that of sustainable development goals. Personally, as a scientist and as a citizen of the world, I very much subscribe to all 17 sustainable development goals. I do very much believe that without those guiding lights to work towards, to live towards and to subscribe to, um, we are lost. We are lost as a, as a global popu population. We, we, we need those shining lights. And one of them is that of offering modern, safe, affordable, and sustainable energy to all, for all, by 2030. And, and one of my uh, next slides, actually, I think the my next slides shows our um, challenges in, in reaching this goal by, by 2030. But if we are to continue to work in an accelerated fashion towards it, it has to be through digitalization. It has to be with a digital road in mind. The next is simply a, a fact that exploitation of, um, of, of technologies that have, um, ha have, have come to be uh, to date has been done exceedingly. I don't think there is any more advantage in exploiting um, coal-based, fossil fuel-based technologies. And if we want to exploit renewable technologies, 
on sound foundations, if we want to move towards a world that is powered by wind, that is powered by sun, that is powered by waves, then we'd better build that new world on the sound foundation of the digital, which is the modern day's foundation. Turning around a little bit to both the global north and the global south, the increase uh, in fuel poverty across regions and, and, and national nations and the international um, landscape has been tremendous. In the past two years alone, um, the fuel poverty has doubled. Fuel poverty citizens have doubled in numbers. The UK has now entered a, a, an age, an era where fuel poverty is pervasive for more than 30% of our population. This is something that has, has never been encountered uh, in the UK, a fuel poverty across the globe, uh, it's, it's, it's accentuating, it's deepening, and it's pushing us to those fast solutions that can come from digital optimization, from working to um, with very small margins that digital controllers can offer us uh, in order to reduce the number of fuel poverty uh, citizens across the globe. Uh, last but not least, I'm not going to talk about smart cities, but I would like to acknowledge that we are all different and all of our needs for energy are different. The utility that we all gain from energy is, is different and from, variety, from a variety of energy services and personalization of energy and the services that are driven from energy with energy is not possible without the digital. We can't be personalizing our offer and our uptake of energy services without doing so in the digital domain. So there is no doubt in my mind that all of these angles concur to tell us that hard as it is, complex and challenging as it is, we need to transition from an analog energy world to a digital energy world. And we have to do that pretty fast. So moving on to my next slide, I want you to focus a little bit on the Sustainable uh, Development Goal 7. Uh, and just to bring up a few, a, a few facts that, that make cause for haste in working towards digital energy transitions and, and also uh, make cause for some worry uh, on, on where we are likely to be in 2030. So my first slide, you see that the decade between 2020, uh, 2010 and 2020 has saw uh, an, an absolutely staggering reduction in the number of people that don't have any access to energy at all, to electricity, sorry. Uh, and, and that decreased within a decade from 1.2 billion to just about 750 millions in 2019. Now that big um, uh, bout of investment of humanitarian input of attention um, to energy uh, in the sustainable development goals set has, has uh, um, made a, a, a dent uh, into the 1.2 billion that is not going to be reproducible. And indeed, the trends that we are seeing by now in 2023 would show that by 2030, we are going to be miles away, 60, 60, 160 million people away from our uh, Sustainable Goal 7 realization of everybody having access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy, including electricity by then. Most of the 660 million people are in Sub-Saharan Africa. The good news is that most of the innovation that, that is needed in renewable systems and in application and implementation of renewable systems in community approaches to renewable systems design uh, and, and smart systems design also comes from Sub-Saharan Africa. So my prediction is that by 20, 2030, would have, we would have made, if we harness the power of creation on the continent, sufficiently. And if we engage the global north and global south to work together, that 660 million won't be the figure of people without uh, electricity in 2030, but something much lower uh, will be in place. 
Needless to mention that um, the 660 million prediction are not the only people that we need to help support with innovation in this sector. There are 4 billion people that still rely on inefficient and polluted, polluted cooking. And that's in 2020. So when we think about energy and when we talk about digitalization, as I do today in my talk, uh, it is because I chose to, to um, work and innovate mostly in the space of electricity, but don't forget that the same innovation uh, and the same support for digitalization is also required in, in cooking systems and cooking energy. And that is a part of the energy ecosystem that has not uh, progressed quite as much in the past decade um, as the, the provision of electricity to, to all. So I'm going to go to my next slide because I'm a big talker and I uh, I have a, a number of things that I wanted to, to uh, bring to bear in the talk today towards the discussions that I'm hoping we are going to have after the talk. So I think I convinced you that there is a need for digital, digitalization. I convinced you that maybe the digital energy infrastructure is something we need to um, put a lot of attention and innovation into. And I also convinced you that the scale of the impact that we can have um, with digitalization of energy is absolutely huge, is staggeringly so. so I thought maybe I put a, a little reminder here on what would be needed um, for us to travel the road to achieve a connected digital energy infrastructure and that I'm talking about connectivity here not at any particular scale so you can think about connectivity at the local smart uh, local energy system scale connectivity uh, at a national scale connectivity as at a global scale for our digital energy infrastructure because energy is one of those one of those areas where, um, where we are not alone. For whichever way we look at energy, there isn't a, an individual that is creating and using it. There, there isn't a household. There isn't a locality of a, um, a district. There isn't the locality of a city that is connected in the energy infrastructure. But it's a global thing. It's a global thing. And, and, and the, the, the war in Ukraine has brought that forward really, really massively. We are all connected already when it comes to the energy infrastructure. We just need to think about making that connectivity work for us rather than against us as it has happened um, in, in, uh, in the recent um, months um, of, of the war. So how do we achieve it? Well, there are four concepts there that for me are driven concepts. They're not in the realm of engineering, not all of them. They are not in the realm of computer science, not all of them, but they are societal pillars that we all need to understand and that we all need to appreciate that have an input towards our connected worldwide digital energy infrastructure. So the first of all is the plug and play aspect, so the plug and play pillar. Now, we are all citizens of the world and we are all very much used to plug and play. We plug and play into our uh, other digital services. We plug and play into our phones. Uh, we plug and play apps into our phones. We plug and play games onto our computer systems. Our children plug and play into their digital devices and their access to digitalization in all sorts of ways. And I would like to propose here that digital architectures that are flexible, that can be plugged into with the variety of renewable systems that we bring to bear, um, in, in the new energy era remains a big strong pillar of building a connected digital energy infrastructure. The second pillar to me is open data. Open data is something that um, as students, as researchers, as um, teachers, we are, we are coming across more and more um, in this day and age. And open data is important because working towards it, promoting it, and opening our own data as champions of world's open data. It's the best thing that we can do in our, in our jobs as academics and in our um, pursuit as a student of, of the knowledge of the world. 
Uh, open data allows us to share, allows us to learn from others, allows us to improve and allows us the ethics of constructing systems that will work equally for everyone. Data that is closed, data that is company owned, data that comes from research that is cosseted by, by the creators of, of, uh, of that research means that anything that is drawn from that local data will only be valid and validated in that locality. So I would propose that any data that we generate, that any data that we can promote the openness of will help us design energy systems and services that will suit everyone because everyone is represented. If research is happening in uh, the UK, uh, on, on desirability of energy services, on use of energy, I would suggest that that needs to be matched, opened and matched with data that is collected in Asia, in Africa, in America about the same topics, because those um, units of open data will come together to maybe help support better uh, ethical um, uh, systems that would represent the people in the UK and the people in uh, um, Africa and the people in America equally, because all of the data has been used to design those systems. I would also uh, like to suggest that responsible innovation has to be a guiding principle for any, any ventures and adventures in the energy sector um, here with. The new value propositions need to build on community capacity through economic empowerment. We need to think about offers and building into energy systems um, um, innovation that caters for empowerment and empowerment of the people that will uh, pay for and use those innovations. So responsible innovation has to be core, a core attribute of any uh, energy systems for the future. And lastly, I would like to, to uh, suggest that transparency in the production and, and collection of energy data and the statistics that are drawn from that data um, it, it's, it's essential in order for that data to aid a greater public and sector understanding of energy te technologies. We need to be ready to be transparent about the negative uh, lenses that may come from data, transparent about failure in our designs, transparent about, about things that don't work well after we've innovated in energy in order to be able to make um, haste with, with improved um, efforts in the future. So for me, these are, these are the four things that can um, uh, underpin sound um, community systems uh, for energy provision in the future of the digital energy infrastructure. So moving on to my next slide. I'd like to now um, maybe, maybe uh, look a little bit into the role of the smart local energy systems and would like to punctuate that by um, reminding ourselves that AI is everywhere. Artificial intelligence is taken a, a, a big first place in, in, in all of our endeavors of bettering our society, uh, bettering services, bettering any areas of, um, of technology and, and development. And I would like to propose that AI can enhance the provision of uh, uh, optimization for resources in uh, smart local energy systems much more than it would and it could in generic national energy systems. So AI thrives on data. It thrives on serving a community that has cohesion and smart local energy systems can provide that cohesion and provide that, that fulfilling that role through AI of local optimization because data is local, because we can drive um, engines on data that, that shares common characteristics and the likelihood of local energy systems um, to share characteristics in the community is very high. 
communities seem, seemed and tend to have the same uses of energy, the same sources for energy, and, and are can, can thus be rounded around sharing parameters in the AI space. I would also like to say that when we intend and put out an intent to design a smart local energy system, that will encourage communities to smarten up themselves. That will encourage communities to think more about equality in the access of the energy. That think more about the means and the ways by which fuel poverty can, um, can, can, can be um, um, run away from can be combated. It, it can encourage communities to come up with solutions that will work for all rather than just for individuals and will provide control to those communities um, that links the physical assets of generation through the data captured with the um, assets that are returned, which is the assets of energy and energy services. And those connections and control can be put to good use to offer more flexibility, to offer usability, and maybe lead to scalability of the energy systems. So I would like to say that smart citizens, smart cities, smartness at local level can help support greater use of the energy that is produced through, through smart energy systems that deliver upon the, the local resource. So if a, if a country, if a zone, if a community has uh, loads of solar power to exploit, the systems that are built on that solar power through community participation, through smartening up the citizens that are going to be using that community are the ones likely to be sustainable in the future, the ones likely to provide the lowest cost per kilowatt hour from the energy generated, and the ones that are likely to uh, work out the best, the use of the technology so that it weathers well and um, supports that community for a long time. So with that, we can move up to summarize uh, on, on what are some of the benefits of a fully digitalized energy, um, uh, energy system. So not only all of the infrastructure is described by data, but also the data that is inherently gathered within the energy system can allow us to make predictions for future behavior. Future behavior, learning from the use today can inform the delivery of energy in that local energy system for tomorrow. Learning uh, on what the future behavior is likely to be allows us to shape our energy markets, allows us to trade energy from peer to peer and from localities of peers to a national grid, for example. Monitoring and analytics in a digital system work together to, to deliver a detailed view of the optimization and the aging of that system. Aging of systems and subsystems allow us to do predictive maintenance and to replace things before they are um, failing completely and make uh, the, the energy system uh, unusable and, and uh, unable to deliver its promise to the citizens that are connected to it. We can also unlock through data a host of consumer benefits. Consumer benefits that could talk at um, extrapolation and extension of services. And more than anything, it allows us to make considerations that are of an economic nature in a locality for the benefits of those citizens. As I said, through the peer-to-peer, -peer, for example, trading of services. And by including more citizens, if we have surplus energy into that local uh, energy system or limiting the services that that, that um, local energy system can offer in order to make that um, uh, provision of services more reliable and more robust. So these are just six of the um, main um, benefits that a fully digitalized energy system can, can offer. And as you can see here, all of the benefits have returned to the people that contribute or to the people that design or to the people that um, uh, avail themselves of the 
energy provided locally in that smart local energy system. So actually in my in my book and, and in my talk today, I hope that the message, the main message is loud and clear. This is all about people. This is so very little about um, technology. And technology can be digitized if we put our mind to it, but all of the benefits of that digitization and, and all of the return on investment is for the people that uh, avail themselves from energy in the first place. And with that, I'm going to go to what stops us um, if, if we are quite so clever uh, on, on what the um, advantages are, we, we, can, we can articulate them so well, we know how to do it technologically, what are the barriers to progress? And I would come to say that all of the barriers to progress, like all of the benefits of the progress, are also to do with people. Uh, here are a few of them. And I chose to put six because I've featured six benefits to people, involving people and involving behaviors, and six barriers. So <laughs> design. We don't know yet how to best drive design protocols around ethical considerations, allow local practices, allow local um, cultures, how to drive informed consent, how to deal with privacy in the digital space. Because once you make everything digital, everything hangs around data. All of the benefits that you get from a digital system comes from handling the data that is generated therein. And all that data has one or more aspects of privacy. And unless we know how to handle that data ethically, how to handle privacy, how to handle security within the design of the system and the protocols that lead to a technological design, we can't progress to a fully digitized but fair offer in the digital space of energy. Fragmentation is another people problem, another barrier to progress, rather than collaborative data-driven solutions, data collection is rather unevenly distributed across many organizations. There are many organizations whose assets is in data and they have issues around data sharing. So the, the fragmentation that we see in, in the sector makes us think that, that that progress is going to be limited because some people have data and will make some progress for some parts of the citizens of the world and some people haven't got data and thus progress is going to be much slower to come. The next uh, barrier is the structural um, inequality and in allocation of, of resources. I think we are not all on a fair playing field of influence, access, access to funding, uh, large companies versus small startups, creativity versus inability of pursue that creativity into, into products. So I think, I think that the structural inequality that we see in the world today in all sorts of other areas also bars progress in the digital energy sector. Culture, policy, and the skills gaps are probably other worthwhile um, areas of, of concern and barriers to progress. And I'm not going to stop so much um, over them because they are not necessarily um, all, all around um, energy, but or, or, or are, are valid across all aspects of, of life and all aspects of progress, uh, science, technology, arts and humanities, and so on and so forth. So is more technology the answer? And that's what my next slide is uh, set to discuss. More technology is not necessarily the answer and not the answer definitely, um, particularly in, in the global south and, when south and when we look across all of the energy ecosystem. I told you at the beginning of my talk that I had um, the privilege to work on a very large project on uh, the energy ecosystem uh, and trying to understand what good looks like, what design protocols that involve communities may look like, and chose for that, uh, for enabling that understanding, probably the harshest setting uh, in the global, global north and the global south that I could have possibly had. So I went to work at understanding the barriers to energy access and how um, fair energy systems should look like in the context of refugees and refugee camps. And I worked thus in three refugee camps in, uh, in Rwanda that cover in amongst themselves something around half a million um, refugees. 
And I looked at the whole of the energy ecosystems with all of the actors that have something to say and have something to uh, offer um, to the transition to fair energy in situations where energy access was limited to a very, very small percent percentage in those um, um, refugee camps, very, very close to zero, actually. And I went to work to, to see how the refugees saw themselves within the energy ecosystem, what would promote agency for change for them, what community processes could aid the use of energy if it's made uh, um, and offered as a, a common pool resource, as a resource uh, to people to, to avail themselves of. How could they use that energy in order to change for better, in order to educate, in order to uh, derive businesses that could make them thrive economically, uh, in order to come together as a community with better cohesion to do better things together. Uh, and and the problem um, the, the 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 problems that we found and we uncovered during um, uh, this this very wealthy project is called HEED, uh, H E E D, and um, it's uh, it's featured on uh, on the next um, slide of uh, lessons that we've uh, we've learned. Is something that anybody here, if if if, if interested, can find out more from uh, from our uh, web pages. But what we found is that. Actually, um, the barriers to progress, the barriers to fair energy, the, the barriers for communities to use energy more cohesively to a better good, a bigger good, were not technological. We deployed energy installations that were based on solar, as you would imagine, in Rwanda. Um, we've deployed quite a few technologies. We deployed um, uh, um, uh, solar lanterns, we deployed a solar microgrid, we deployed uh, electrification for a number of, uh, of institutions as, a, as an interdisciplinary team from Coventry University together with NGOs and, um, uh, and, and other um, actors in, uh, in Rwanda. And we use an awful lot of sensor data to, to evidence our understanding. We've very clearly shown, um, as my next slide, um, uh, uh, shows that th there was a, a scope and uh, um, uh, maybe a remit for our understanding to be to be um, generalized um, in the face of the 105 million uh, people that are in, in very similar settings um, to the use of the 27 million refugees that live in camps all over the world. And with a view of the long term settlements that these camps have, have with, with about 18 years being the average time that a refugee spends in a refugee, um, refugee camp. So one of the main findings um, on the next um, slide shows that, that the technological um, barriers were few, while the people barriers were many. And one of the more, more interesting um, findings was that access to energy is gendered. Whether the energy was uh, electricity generated from the renewable systems that we deployed in, uh, uh, in the camps, or whether um, energy is still um, looked at with the lens of the, of the fossil fuels, there is a, a big, big gender gap. The, the, there is a big... Um, um, uh, variation in the way that energy is perceived, in the way that energy is used, in the way that energy is thought about and controlled within the households. Gender matters. We've learned that as long as we continue to drive technology with development um, in camps, uh, at, at least, with a view that any participant in the design process is a good participant, we are never going to be able to design the right energy systems, simply because the females' uh, views on, on how an energy system should serve them are very different from the male views. So one of the, one of the findings, as I said, that is not to do with the technology, but to do with the people, is that we need to consult very differently. And we need to consult um, the communities with a view of asking all genders, asking all age groups, what would mean to have the right, the best energy system 
to, um, uh, to serve them. And an example in the next uh, slide is um, from uh, um, the Nyabiheke camp, where we managed effort. We've, we've had all sorts of people understanding of what makes good energy. We've designed a standalone solar system that supplied energy for a community hall, and we did everything right. We started with the community. We started with a community committee that was balanced, that had equal representation from male and female, that had a very good age structure where the youths of that community were equally represented as the elders, the knowledgeable um, experiential uh, segment of that community. And we've uh, put together uh, um, a solar system that ended up serving that community from karate um, uh, classes all the way to celebrations and all the way to sadder um, um, events such as funerals. But it served all community equally and has been exploited and utilized in the best um, possible way. And I'm now going to skip to my last slide. I'm going to, to skip my slide 14 and move on to my last slide of the talk um, to up, oh, just to say that uh, my main learning from all of my work in energy is that a whole society approach is necessary. Technological approaches to energy systems design fail to work, um, demonstrably fail in in many ways. The whole society doesn't necessarily mean that we are uh, designing global systems, although we are designing globally connected systems, but the whole society approach to local smart energy systems where the citizens are part of the design process and are represented, all of the segments of the citizens are represented, uh, will be the recipe for success. So, I would say that anyone that is involved in promoting sustainable energy systems, learning about them, teaching others about them, or just talking about the future's smart local energy system would need to think about promoting a whole society approach, introducing uh, alternative energy funding streams is within, is, if it is within their power that work towards citizens being consumers and prosumers, consuming and gaining from energy provision, devising energy policy, if that's their remit and their power, that favors carefully considered partnerships which support community engagement and offer comprehensive packages of support if that is within their power um, for digital literacy around energy for groups traditionally excluded from decision making. So there is something in there for everyone. I am in the promote category. Uh, but there are many people out there in the in the public at large that have um, influence over funding streams, that have influence over policy, and that have influence over education of the citizen in digital literacy. And thank you for uh, your attention. And questions are welcomed. Thank you. Uh, I can't so, hear you. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I think, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah, so very I was well. saying thank you very much uh, for your insight into this world of uh, digital energy. Um, we are, we are uh, I think we should move to the questions now. So we got uh, uh, members uh, uh, of, uh, of the public attending. We got students from uh, Middlesex University, I guess, uh, not all of them, but uh, probably the majority coming from Middlesex University attending uh, your, your talk. So uh, we would uh, welcome questions from you, uh, students attending and from other uh, members of the audience. Uh, but uh, while you're thinking of your questions, uh, let's take a few questions that uh, uh, people have been asking online, I can see one. Uh, are business models and the way we work hindering energy transition? If so, how can we overcome this? 
this is first question from uh, uh, one of the staff of Medin, who is helping us a lot into uh, into driving the uh, the Uni City Education Hub lecture series. So you you can see. Uh, uh, the talk, Elena. Uh, yes. Can see the questions. Yes. Yes. Very okay. much so. Yes. So I, I think so, I think the answer is uh, yes to the first question. Yes to the second main question that hasn't been read out yet. But um, in, in terms of the business models, I think we are uh, we are very much used to a a, a one way business model. We are looking at the generator the owner of the capital um, um, infrastructure for generating the energy as as the owner of the business and we are deploying that business against uh, payment to the citizen so that that's a one way street so the business model that says i own infrastructure i produce energy and i get people to use it and pay for it that's a business model that doesn't work in the in 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 in, in the modern world no more no more and no more for several reasons. One is because um, uh, the traffic is two ways um, because people are now um, um, learning and empowering themselves to become generators of energy themselves. And they need to have an outlet to sell just as well as the big companies have outlets to sell uh, their energy. The second is a moral um, impediment to the current business models. We have energy from the sun, uh, and that's 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 a common resource, and that's a godsend. We have energy from the wind, and we have energy from the waves. Just because a part of our segment of our society have the finances to harness that energy it doesn't mean that it belongs to them not entirely and not fully so so i think business models that are uh, fairer more equitable that empower people to take and give that empower people to buy and sell energy um as they capture it uh, or on on their roofs um on the the, the back of the, the back gardens that they they have to um to put in solar panels in particular or on their boats if they uh, if they harness um, um, wave energy with um, uh, with modern and forthcoming means uh, will change will we'll need to be included those so the prosumers need to be included in those business models the other thing that that is not right with the current business models is fixed rate uh, we know that there is no such thing as energy consumption at the same rate um, seasonally and uh, and diurnally and nocturnally so business models that don't allow for the variations and for the demand um, driven pricing are, are also about to to die so the answer is we need people in economics to be creative around business models uh, we need people to be included and we need those business models to be fairer than they were in the past so how do we overcome this well with more research uh, with lobbying, with showing the power of citizens and citizenship, and with educating our consumers to become prosumers. The second question, um, how can we be more inclusive as a transition um, to clean energy, given the tech side is it's expensive? I think inclusivity is not just about ownership. I think inclusivity, it's about the principles upon which we build our technologies. And if those principles are fair and inclusive, if the um, the design of systems is fair and inclusive, then it doesn't really matter who finances the technology. So I would I would say that inclusivity starts at home and starts um, uh, starts with the with the localities and the communities that that we try to serve with the energy system, not forgetting to bring them into the fold of the design and the decision making early on. More than that, not forgetting that we need to empower them specifically to be part of that consultation. If we just bring them to the table without giving them the power and the loud voice at that table, we haven't done well at all. We just have done lip service to inclusivity. Uh, the next one, the next question I, I, I'd like to answer is that of uh, risk of energy being weaponized and cyber terrorists or rogue states. And I'm going to say, don't even need to go into uh, into rogue rogue states and cyber terrorism. We can just 
think very simply of cyber attacks. Uh, and, and, and an awful lot of the um, cyber attacks of the, the modern day have shown that energy is actually the most vulnerable of our digital world assets. So cyber attacks that may actually go towards defense will pass through the energy filter and would be, um, uh, if, if, if allowed, uh, and would bring down the whole country, would bring down institutions, would bring down hospitals. And I would say they would do more damage than just about any other weapon that we can conceive short of nuclear bombs. So um, yes, energy can be weaponized. Yes, we are doing too little. To, um, to progress um, with the research and implementation of cybersecurity layers onto energy. Uh, it's particularly difficult to design good cybersecurity around energy because on the one hand, we want energy to be distributed and distributedly controlled. On the other hand, we don't know how to do distributed cybersecurity. So that's a little bit of a take and give. Uh, and I would say that it's a big call to the computer science community in cybersecurity to work faster and better towards distributed energy systems protection. That's that, that that's that's my take on that. Uh, that research is coming along far too slow by far too few people. Uh, how difficult it is to transition from a traditional centralized analog energy system to a difficult one? Well, I would say that transition has to be gradual. Um, uh, uh, energy infrastructure is a critical asset for any nation, for any country for any community. We can't just do away with the old and put the new in. And we can actually have um, um, incremental transition to energy, a step-by-step -step transition to energy by not condoning the analog in what we build now and by, by putting the investment into interfaces that connect us with the old analog infrastructure and by replacing failing parts of the old analog infrastructure with digital replacement. And that is going to cost us more, uh, absolutely. Replacing like for like is very cheap to do. Replacing old analog systems with new digital and interfacing with the, with the backbone, the analog backbone is bound to be, to be costing us. But on long term, that's the only way in which we can uh, eventually arrive as a fully digitized national energy infrastructure. And the last question I have, energy storage is critical for the use of rene renewables. Technological progress in this field seems to be lagging. Any comments? Uh, I don't think it's lagging too much. I think it's coming too slow because there are issues there too. Uh, as you know, exploitation of resources that come into the making of batteries, it's in itself um, an area that is open to criticism uh, along the fair exploitation, along where those resources are and how they are currently mined. So if we want to be fair and if we want to be ethical, we need to be very careful on how we mine resources to build new batteries, more batteries. I'm going to say that actually uh, building more and building better is not that um, um, forthcoming. Uh, um, I, I think it's not a, it's not a for, there are no forthcoming solutions to building more and better faster, but there are forthcoming solutions to optimize the energy that is put in a battery, make better use of it, uh, and make batteries replaceable. Uh, in, in in segments, for example, so uh, electric cars are are an area where we we can learn an awful lot from when we talk about scaling up energy provision and making the most of it. So I think I think the um, absolute um, optimization that we get from a electric car battery is something we have to still dream about when we talk about applying the same lessons or, or um, achieving the same uh, um, efficiency from a solar system um, uh, battery that serves our homes or a, or a community hall or a microgrid. So, so let's do the things that we can do by borrowing from other sectors first before we rush into new materials. Uh, I see there are two more questions. Uh, and I think that's all we have for now, is it?
I think we got four of them. I think you've answered all of them. Uh, since you're talking of uh, of batteries, uh, I have one question on that. Uh, we see that for the for the electric cars, we see that when the batteries have reached, let's say, about eighty five percent efficiency after you know four or five years, they got to they have to re, to to be replaced, right? So the question is, the batteries still have eighty percent or eighty five percent efficiency. So we just discard them and replace them by new batteries. So uh, I understand there's a lot of research going on on battery management system where we can reprogram those batteries to do other things. And that could be something more sustainable. And you know, we use the batteries that are still more or less efficient, not for cars, but for other things. And, uh, uh, but we, uh, you know, we divert them to some other kind of uh, applications. Well, what is your take on that? I think the circular economy has a big role to play in energy as it has in all of the other sectors. And what we are talking about here is reuse of very expensively and sometimes unethically mined materials that are part of uh, of the construction of uh, of the best batteries that we can put our hands on um, this this day and age. And and I do I do I do appreciate that that. That, that that's absolutely correct. Uh, having a holistic view on uh, where and how to use batteries that are not necessarily sufficiently good for uh, pressing the uh, accelerator pedal down to the ground and making that uh, car move into solar systems that draw much um, uh, slowly and gently uh, on, on the energy provision is a very good idea. And I think, again, that this is something for the research community to consider and think about. We, we do a lot of research and a lot of work on circular economy, reuse uh, and elimination of waste, uh, disposing of, of batteries is one of those areas where we need to be keener to research into. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, do you or any other group at uh, your university, Coventry University, do you have anyone working on, for example, uh, looking at uh, uh, other means uh, uh, you know, for uh, instead of lithium batteries, looking on, for example, uh, seawater uh, batteries. Uh, do you have any such thing going on at uh, yes, the University we of Toronto? Yeah, we have actually a, a whole research group that um, works on batteries exclusively, um, and an, an alternative, uh, an alternatives to to fossil fuel. Um, the, the, they work on battery management. They work with testing of batteries with improvements to existing materials and also with hydrogen fuel cells. Okay, so maybe we have a few questions from uh, our audience. Any, any question that's a burning question from you? Uh, nothing from you? Batteries falling down? <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, I'm not hearing anything. Uh, I, I may uh, move on to the to to, to next question. Uh, I was talking about uh, decarbonization, decentralization, democratization, digitization. You added one to it, which <laughs> is uh, uh, getting to G D gender, uh, which I, I found uh, quite 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 interesting. Yeah. Uh, but then when we when we talk of decentralization uh, and moving to local, how does it take place in our developing world? Which is highly centralized in, when, we, when, we, when it comes to uh, you know fields of energy, and how do you move from a highly centralized system to a decentralized one, you know, in our developing world on, and also on the African continent? How do you do that? Gosh, um, I <laughs> I think uh, I, I I think if I had a, a good answer to to that, I, um, I I probably would have gained my next series of research projects to go and, and try it out. Uh, but I, I, I can I can only I can only say from what I've seen. So he, I, I can give you an answer from my work in Rwanda. So in Rwanda, the refugee camps had absolutely no um, electricity connectivity. So the NGOs operating those camps and the UNHCR uh, had their own offices and their own diesel generator, dirty generator, powering up their, their offices and the small, um, uh, maybe, maybe sanitary point, um, um, medics, um, 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 
uh, building um, for primary primary emergency care, and 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 that was I was forever surprised what was going on there because the the national um, uh, electricity network was uh, the national grid was was passing passing the camps just across right. So, so it, it seems absurd that you bring in diesel generators, you, you transport um, diesel at great cost, very, very inefficient form of uh, electrification. Um, I, 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 and you actually have your, your national grid passing you by, you are not at the back of the sticks. So the first, the, the first question was, why is this happening? And the, the answer was political. And the second, um, um, observation was that um, when we began to electrify and we built our microgrids, and when we began to have surplus from um, from the generation uh, for all sorts of not so good reasons, we, we we had a lot of energy electricity surplus. There was nowhere to dump it, so then you do battery dumps, and then you start to get serious about connecting. Um, installations such as this to to the national grid, and the answer was again political. So, so I think I think that until we resolve the political stance on decentralization, nothing very much will happen. But once that becomes a, a go ahead and a green light from from a government perspective, and once governments have enough evidence um, to understand that. Patching into the energy system renewables as they pop in in the locality can help support the robust delivery of energy nationally until governments realize that uh, and, and understand that the costs associated with interfacing small things that are popping up to the local to the national grid uh, until until we understand that and until we do that we, we don't have a chance in the world so decentralization doesn't mean taking apart what exists is mean being able to add small things that are local to a big thing that we had already and make everything work better I, I I think I think that's that's my answer so it's not about splitting the centralization it's about enabling decentralization to be added to a central core okay uh, I think you you have uh, you have replied perfectly to uh, to to the question and uh, in fact I was also alluding to uh, what our uh, policy people should do uh, to make this happen. So um, you you uh, you gave the answer that it should come from uh, you know uh, much higher up yeah. and in terms of putting the right policies in place. So um, anything else uh, from you uh, inspired about anything? Uh, not so much now. Uh, I can see one more question uh, in the in the Q and A. Uh, let me check for it. Uh, yeah, I see one question about uh, um, any comments on the energy sources that do not create any or less waste, such as batteries. Any comments on the energy sources that do not create any or less waste, such as batteries? Uh, I, I can't. I can't possibly. I, I think we are, as a university, we are investing a lot in hydrogen research. Uh, hydrogen is growing on importance uh, nationally in the UK, but there are, of course, all sorts of risks, reasons, and safety and, and criticality risks around the use of hydrogen, particularly for um, the white population sector and for transportation. Uh, I, I am afraid I, I am not sufficiently okay. knowledgeable to answer that question properly. Um. Yeah, uh, so I, I am not uh, hearing anything from uh, from uh, uh, from our audience. Maybe a uh, last question before we close the session, uh, Elena. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask you: uh, How far have we moved into uh, you know the uh, local uh, into the smart local energy systems? Uh, you know, around the world, because you say that it's not only uh, uh, happening in the UK. So do you have concrete examples where this is happening 
in other parts of the world, for example, in the southern part of the world, in Africa, and if ever uh, there could be some partnerships between uh, you, uh, your group, and uh, our group here, uh, you know, into uh, deploying something that could be of interest to uh, the community around, uh, uh, you know, around Medin. And uh, you should know that we're also looking towards the establishment of a smart city here. So I think uh, getting the community involved could also be uh, interesting and in how far you could to partnership uh, being done. So um, I, I do I do believe that uh, for for the UK, this has been the first attempt at evidencing systematically the power and the value uh, and, and unlocking the value of a smart local energy system. As I said, we are coming out of uh, um, a five-year program on um, um, powering the future rev energy revolution for the UK, uh, or um, prospering from the future energy revolution. That was a uh, hundred and something million pounds program. I think uh, a next program is going to be launched to scale up the findings. I think uh, various governments are moving relatively slowly on uh, on the agenda. The Nordic countries tend to be doing a lot better at community energy systems and smart local energy systems, uh, particularly in Finland and Norway and, and so forth. So I think I think um, they woke up earlier than the UK to, to the idea of smartness and locality. Uh, I think the US is doing particularly well at connecting um, renewable energy producers with, with the grid. Um, th th there are quite a few uh, programs that support also households with um, deployment of uh, solar panels. So I think there is a lot of investment this day and age in the US um, to, to smartness and locality. I think in Africa, probably one of the leading countries in solar energy that that uh, promotes um, uh, local energy farms, renewable energy farms is Kenya. And uh, I think all of us all across the world have a lot to learn from the innovation that goes on in Kenya in the um, uh, solar PV area and smart, um, smart solar farms. Uh, in terms of cooperation and and um, uh, and working together are uh, always happy to, to to partner up I think funding uh, particularly in the UK funding to to work in um, um, the developing context has for a while dried up but that's not to say that it won't come back again we have um, uh, a very large program that is going to be launched in January and is worth if there is interest, to be watching out for it is called the Catalyst. Um, and the Catalyst program will be investing um, um, significantly for energy projects that bring businesses and universities together in the developing world, particularly in Asia and, uh, and Africa. Uh, the, the programs need the business aspects and they need the political will behind um, behind the project, so they are not led by academics, they are led by, um, uh, oh, so sorry, they, they are led by business people. Um, so if there are businesses that you have access to that have a big word to say in, in renewable energy, that would be a call that um, we can collaborate and avail ourselves of funding from and do something together. Yeah, that could be uh, something great and uh, could uh, uh, could uh, kind of trigger a partnership between us and uh, and you and your group there. So uh, with these words, uh, let me uh, thank you, Elena, again for uh, this brilliant talk and uh, all the sharing uh, and all the new ideas and insights that you brought to us um, and to you are open to uh, you know new collaborations and more importantly to promoting women in engineering so we've got a lot of uh, uh, of uh, female students in the audience and uh, so i don't know if you you are interested in the field of engineering or uh, or digital uh, so there's a lot to be done and uh, and professor uh, elena gara has been uh, you know, doing a lot for the promotion of women on the African continent, especially in the field of uh, of engineering. So uh, thank you again.
for this uh, brilliant intervention. And uh, we look forward to talking to you in, in the near future and to see how we can promote uh, uh, you know, a, a partnership between, between our group and yours. Thank you so, for inviting uh, thank me. You, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you a lot. And uh, uh, on behalf of uh, you know, the Median Group and on behalf of Udicity Education Hub, I also uh, thank all the, all the attendees, you here present, and all those who've been attending online and probably uh, uh, being enriched by uh, all the uh, knowledge that you brought to us. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.